Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mom's Writers Club. I'm Jessica. And I'm Sarah. And today we are going to talk about how to make your book shorter. But first, we have our mom rant of the day. Okay. <clears throat> oh, I'm timing you. You don't get I'm to time yourself. Sarah's okay. got the mom rant today, everyone. Okay. No, I'm timing right. you. All right. Ready? I need to be able to do the countdown. No, not yet. Okay. On your mark, get set, go. Okay. Kids' birthday parties have jumped the shark. You do not have to invite all 30 kids to every birthday party. You know what that means? You are going to 30 birthday parties every year and you are bringing cheap plastic crap and you are bringing home cheap (laughs) plastic crap and the cheap plastic crap is just circulating everywhere and the kids don't open their birthday presents, which I think is just like really sad because you bring this nice present and you don't get to watch your friend enjoy it and your friend doesn't get to like open it, enjoy it and say thank you and, and just like, okay. Number of years old equals number of guests at your birthday party. It totally works. Try it. Done. That was 38 seconds. Oh, I totally could have taken <laughs> Is that time. our fastest one yet? <laughs> I think that's our fastest one yet. Did I hit all the high points? I think I did. I, I think so. Yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> Can I add a little bit? Okay. What's that? If you're going to expect the parent to be there. At Give the them a party, fucking beer. A... Excuse me. Well, I was going to say wine or like cocktail, but <laughs> beer is fine too. Okay. That's all. Okay. That's all we got time for. Nice. Okay. How to make your book shorter. So first of all, let's talk about why, because I cannot tell you how many people I've talked to who are like, no, my book has to be 150 or 300,000 <gasps> words. I've yet to see a book that actually needed to be that long yeah. ever. The other thing is if you're <laughs> wanting to go into traditional publishing, you will not get traditionally published. I know there's some exception out there, but 99.9% of us will not. And if you're writing anything besides science fiction or fantasy, it needs to be less than a hundred thousand words, preferably yeah. 80 to 90 K. That's really the sweet right. spot. Although some genres, and this is adult YA and middle grade and children's, obviously you go shorter. Yeah. Actually YA um, fantasy is often easily that long, but yeah. Yeah. But like generally so, YA is shorter. Yeah. So yeah. a way of thinking about this, if you are really like attached to the length of your book is that, okay, fine. But the odds of success in publishing are really, really long to begin with. And if you decide that that really is how your book needs to be, then you have to accept that being the exception to the rule makes your odds way longer and okay if you can accept that that's okay but you know I've heard agents say that like if they see a book that is like over 100k or you know over 120k that they and I hate saying this like I'm not trying to like yeah that they'll just auto reject it because they assume that you haven't revised it to the point Mm -hmm. it should be the book I wrote before make me disappear I called it lady justice and the original like my no I can't cut anything else was 117,000 words and then I got a new critique partner this is before I met Sarah and she is a she was then an agented author and now is a published author so someone with a little more experience she helped me cut that book down to 85,000 words and I didn't lose anything I thought I was but it's because I had like well we'll go through stuff like excessive dialogue and a lot of repetition and what I realized is I didn't have enough distance from that book to mm-hmm. see it. And also that I just, there were there were things that I was missing. I will say I've heard the argument, well, Laurel K. Hamilton write, but writes books that are 300,000 words. And it's like, that's true. She's also a multi-time number one New York right. Times bestseller. And every book she writes ends up on that list. And she can do whatever she wants. You right. know, How long was her Laurel first Hamilton. book? Yeah, it was about 80,000 words. Mm-hmm. And her yeah, first so we are, several were about 80,000 words. Yeah, we are kind of talking about the book that you're writing if you're trying to get an agent or the book that you are um, putting on sub before you are a massive New York Times bestseller. Like, once you're at that yeah. point, the rules are really different. And I want to make two points. One is that a book longer than a certain number of words, you may know, Jess, it's somewhere around 100,000, requires a more expensive, requires more expensive manufacturing. And so that is harder to sell. And yes, agents are reading thousands and thousands of queries, some of them per month, thousands per month they're going through and they're looking for ways to pare down their, their, yeah, they're not trying to auto reject, but if your book's up 200,000 words long. And, and I know this isn't true across the board and I'm not trying to put anyone down. It is almost an indicator that, um, 
that you're still very novice and that you have a lot of room to grow. If you are querying a book, the the standard is 80,000 and yours is twice that length. Okay. So now that we have been so persuasive in talking about why your book should be shorter, let's talk about how to make your book shorter. Mm -hmm. And I want to add that. So like my drafts have gotten down to like 70 to 80,000 words. And I still do this stuff because it improves the quality of the book. It's yeah. not even just about making it shorter. It's about making your book better. Yeah. Let's preface yeah, this by saying a lot of what we're talking about occurs in revision. Yes. Don't some, worry about this in your first draft. Yeah. Some of us are, we talk about like overwriters and underwriters. I'm kind of an underwriter. Like I write pretty spare drafts and then I have to fill them out. A lot of people write great big wordy drafts. Oops. And then, and then have to pare them down. Totally fine. So what we're talking about here is is what you're doing in revision to kind of get it to the place where you're ready to send it off into the world to agents or on submission or whatever. One of the most annoying things I find in books, in my books, but also in published books, I see all the time are the crutch words, things like very and little and some and a bit and kind of, and it's funny because these and are also some of the, the, go ahead. Just. Just yeah, and just is my crutch word. These are some of the words that I also remove from emails before I hit send. <gasps> yeah, because yeah. they are the words that like they uh they make it less strong. They make it right. more. Mm -hmm. Well, if you could just maybe kind of do this thing or do a I little. I was just you know, thinking that this could be a little blah blah blah. Yeah, they keep you from getting to the point, and you yes, can almost exactly. always remove all of these. There are occasionally times to leave them in. What I would do if I were you, uh, if you just do a Google search for like crutch words in manuscripts, you'll get a list and just do find. Yeah. And I find that I write with far fewer of them now, but they still are in there. I'll be like rereading my chapter from yesterday and I'll be like, there are three justs in this chapter. Mm -hmm. Delete, delete, delete. Little. Yeah. It really irritates me. Yep. And when I see them in a published book and they aren't cut out and you know what, maybe they don't bother most people. Maybe it's the yeah. author's style by all means, do your thing. I don't like them. I feel like, yeah. I don't know. They're noticeable, but it's a way to pare down your word count and make your writing stronger. Yes. And so yes, Scrivener absolutely. has this fabulous feature and I think word probably does too. I just don't know where it is in word where you can have uh -huh. a word frequency count. And what Scrivener does, it was, will take every individual word in your book and, and count how many times it appears. You can sort them out alphabetically, or you can so sort them by frequency. And then you look through, and of course, you've got it's a million painful. these and ands, but then you get down and you see how many times you use the word just or very, and you will be shocked. You'll be utterly shocked. You will start doing a global find and replace <laughs> those words. Yeah, it's awful. It's yeah. pretty bad. I, I too have done that and it is a painful experience. Yeah, but it's a really great tool, that word frequency counter. You could probably take out a thousand words just by doing that. Oh yeah, for sure. If not yeah. more. Mm -hmm. And also, well, I guess that's the main thing. What about cut filter phrases? We've talked a little bit about this in another episode, but can you talk about that? Right. So filter phrases being those places where we say, let's say if we're in third person, he felt the breeze or he smelled the smoke or he, you know, we were, so he smelled, he felt, he heard, you know, she thought even. She realized. She realized. <laughs> right? That's mine. Those things, what do you say? Uh, probably three quarters of the time yeah, could, can go, I would say three quarters. if not more. Yeah, I agree. And it will improve your writing. It, yes. it makes it much more direct and to the point instead of right. You know, she realized he was walking into the room. He walked right. into the room. You know, right. it, it can be that yeah. simple. And the same thing goes for first person. I'm awful about it in my first draft with first person. I realized that thing was happening. I watched as the person walked in. How about just yeah. the person walked in? Because obviously right. we're in your head. Of course you're watching it. Tagging on with that, I would say, and this is not on our list, but it should be passive verbs. Because mm. often you're saying, I was running. I ran. It should just be mm -hmm. I ran. Right, and right. This is a two thirds to three quarters of these can be changed. Basically, yeah. anything where it's like was and then a verb, often an verb, in a, ing, which I think is a gerund. Yeah, I think that's the technical word. <laughs> I will agree with you or believe you on that. Right. 
Yeah, this cuts it down from two words to one and it, it makes your writing better. This is another pet peeve of mine. When I see this in a published book, I refuse to read the was running and in my head I switch it to ran because <laughs> it annoys me so much. And I'm not saying that all passive verbs are bad because occasionally you actually need it to be a passive verb. Looking for repetition. Uh, what I found is that my characters were often reflecting too often on the same things. And I felt like I needed mm -hmm. to remind the reader of like what was going on for them. And for me, writing this book over the course of several months, you know, maybe it felt that way. But for them, if they're reading the book in five days or a week, they definitely didn't need to be. So um, for me, cutting repetition of their inner thoughts and uh, I guess mostly just their inner thoughts was really helpful on cutting word count and also mm -hmm. excessive dialogue kind yeah. of that was repeating thoughts or things that were already gone over do you have anything to add on repetition that's good and i think we're going to get into it more when we talk about excessive dialogue and excessive oh. showing mm -hmm. so there's this concept with writing a scene arrive late and leave early yeah, yeah you want to get in once the action has already started and you want to get out before like everything's smooth and boring like you right. want to like get that get the reader so, flipping in the next chapter to see what happens yeah excessive setup of the ordinary world like setup of the scene ending of the scene and this takes trusting your reader which is hard because <laughs> you want them to understand and you want them to have context but if you do it too much then they're just like God, it gets boring and long which i think this is something Thing that you learn with experience and mm -hmm. also once you've taken a break from your book and you go back and revise yeah you can yeah. often catch these things yourselves and, it, and a beta reader can also catch them for you and I think right. it just takes experience to kind of find that happy middle ground but this is all this stuff is stuff that you are going to find yourself coming back to over and over I have yeah. known all this stuff for years and I am still fixing it oh, in my current book totally yeah. so these are not bad behaviors these are just yeah. things to like remind you of and remind yourself of like this is a great reminder for us oh totally I do this with with every book and every scene like I'm writing a scene right now where I'm like a does this scene need to exist and b yeah like I feel like I should be out of here by now how do I wrap this up you know it's tricky yeah sometimes I'll just be like end this scene better later and move on because I'm like I don't know how to end this scene and with yeah. thrillers like you want to end them kind of fast-paced so I want to talk more about the thing you just mentioned. Does this scene need to exist? And this right. is a big issue I had in my book three. And this book was like super fast drafted. It's one of the fastest books I've ever written, which felt really great until I needed to revise it and realize what a shit show it was. <laughs> yes, I just called my book a shit show, but it's not anymore. And let me tell right. you why. Because I made scene cards. Yes, me, the pantser. I went back after the fact and I made scene cards and I put them up. I made a scene card for every single chapter. It took forever and a lot of bourbon was involved. Well, actually only a little bourbon because I have a low tolerance and I needed to focus. But <clears throat> I put them on a wall and I got like, I used um, bigger note cards. I used these bigger ones because I wanted to be able to like actually really read everything I didn't want to like have it really little I wanted to be able to step back and look at it on my wall and be able to see what it said so I, I used those in sharpies and I did this for every single chapter my by the way my chapters are usually one scene a piece so if you have multiple scenes in a chapter you might want to do it for every scene <clears throat> and it was nice because I could look at each one and I quickly realized there was like a whole section of the book I could just completely remove and get rid of like not even summarize like just take it out entirely I just completely removed it I had to like patch up a couple things here and there but I completely removed it I added right. a couple different chapters and I cut like I mean I didn't need to cut words and I ended up adding more like backstory in a different spot so it ended up equalizing the words yeah. so that's not an example of cutting words but I realized there was this whole section of the book that just didn't even need to be there. It really yeah. didn't ultimately change anything. And and this is actually very common. I'll even get to line edits and be like, I actually think this chapter does not need to be here. Yeah. And there were a couple of chapters I completely deleted because I, I went back to look at them, you know, a month after I wrote them. And I was like, well, some interesting thoughts happen here, but nothing that affects the outcome of the book right. or the character arc. And And if I literally just lift it out hit delete and scrivener and put it in my little trash folder nothing changes and if yeah. nothing changes you more know. often than not you can just get rid of it okay so you were talking 
you wrote in this note, connective tissue, making connective tissue very lean. What does that mean? So the transition language between scenes. So this is a, a variation on arrive late and leave early for a scene. You need a little something to get us from the scene that happened at night to the scene that happens the next morning. But you may be tempted in the first draft, as I often am, to go into a whole lot of detail about kind of what happened, you know, like how one scene gets to the next scene and how the morning's going and what you're eating you for know breakfast what my biggest, and, you know. My biggest weakness on this connective tissue thing, and I did this in my last book, one that was the shit show until I fixed it. <laughs> um, I would like have two to three paragraphs of reflection before anything happened. And I went oh, through yeah. the book and it was true with almost every chapter. And I don't usually write like that. I don't mm -hmm. know. I mm -hmm. think it's because I was writing so fast that I like, I just let myself do what I needed to do, I guess. Yeah. Um, but I cut all that from almost every single chapter yeah. and got right into the action. And that made the book so much better. Yeah. I read this book several years ago. It was fairly literary. And, um, mm -hmm. and, and it had this rhythm that began to drive me absolutely bonkers after a while, which is that the character would do something and then reflect on it and then do something and then reflect on it. And then something would happen yeah. and they'd reflect on it. Like literally it had it such didn't... a like do, 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 like yeah. rhythm that it was like driving me crazy. <laughs> and I like some reflection. I like some interiority. I don't mind if the, it's a, like a chill pace. I don't, I love literary fiction, but you know, yeah. Excessive reflection. Um, it gets old real fast. It's a place you can target <laughs> if you need to cut your work yeah, out. Yeah, for sure. So, and I think a lot of a reflection is repetitive, or at least yeah. for me, it's repetitive. Yeah. It's something that's already happened, or um, and, and some of that is trusting the reader more. Exactly, I was ex gonna say that exact same thing, right Aww. there. I was just about to okay. interrupt you and say it's about trusting the reader to know what's going on. <laughs> I have a funny insert. This has nothing to do with this, but uh, do you remember that meme? We have to leave this in, sir. That meme that I sent you that was like, at what point do our um voice messages just become a podcast back and <laughs> forth between two people <laughs> okay what made me think of this was that we were like Excuse thinking me. the same thing and we exchange a lot of voice messages most days and um yeah I mean it literally could be a podcast not that we would ever want to disclose publicly some of the things we talk about <laughs> I know but I mean sometimes um, we are doing like cross talk in our voice messages like yeah. I'll be leaving Jess a voice message while she's leaving me a voice message and we'll be we'll have like two whole different conversations going on and it's really funny it's great yeah. it's fun okay <laughs> um summarize versus dramatize and mm -hmm. this is actually the opposite of show versus tell but sometimes it's okay to tell something. You don't right. have to show everything. So How do you are, know the difference? These are kind of different words for show versus tell, which I find it more useful to think of show versus tell as dramatize versus summarize. So dramatize is show, which means you are making a scene. You are putting it on the page, right? And summarize is tell, which means, you know, it's going on the page in summary and not in scene. But you don't need everything in scene. Like if you went out to lunch, no. cool. We went out to lunch instead of we drove the car and then we walked in the room. And and it's a great way to abbreviate. If it's yeah. if it's something that's really important to the book, by all means show it or dramatize it. Yeah. But you'll you'll find that a lot of things can just be summarized and that it really doesn't change the outcome of yeah. the book. So there are a lot of of great people who have a lot of great thoughts about why to do one versus the other. And they both have they're very important place in writing, but, but a way to make your book shorter is to look around and see if I summarized this scene or this bit of a scene or whatever, if I just sort of put it in a couple of sentences and moved on, would my book still work? Um, yeah. And if the answer is yes, then by all means summarize it. But the answer might be no. The answer might be no. I need this detail. I need these, these, I need to show these characters in conflict with one another, whatever, you know, like this needs yeah, to pop need to the out. This needs to come to the yeah. foreground. But if you're, if you're dramatizing everything, if you're putting everything in scene on the page, then like everything's in the foreground. I feel like, I feel like this episode could be subtitled 
um, and make your writing stronger because often when you're doing something that makes your book shorter, it often makes your writing stronger. Not always, but most of the time. If you kind of have everything dramatized and it's all in the forefront, the reader doesn't kind of know what's important, right? But if you have some ebb and flow between summary summarizing and dramatizing between putting something in scene and and summarizing something then the reader kind of like you're leading you're leading them to to what you want them to think which is really important. important yeah 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 exactly i agree with everything sarah just said and i have to go pick up my daughter and this is mom's <laughs> just club so we have to go but but we do have time we have time for one quick question we have a oh, couple yeah, from Belinda, okay. so we'll just we'll do her first one because it's the most simple and the other one's we could almost make a whole episode out of it. She said, what other types of books would you like to write? So I say we both get 60 seconds to answer okay. this question. Sarah, go. Okay. I actually have this um, speculative, near future, quasi dystopian road novel that is like so fully formed in my head that the main character is like 19 years old. So it's sort of YA, but it's not really YA in my head. And I just cannot wait to write this book. I'm excited to read it. Um, this is a really hard question for me to answer. Although I just answered this question on like a blog interview recently. And my answer was, I actually would kind of like to write everything because I have read some science fiction books that I love. And I read some fantasy books that I love. And I used to love writing urban fantasy um, although like none of that is at the forefront right now. I think the next genre I might, which this is not in the plans at all, but if I were going to, would either be book club slash women's fiction or some version of romance. And I'm not sure what that would be. Maybe, maybe mafia romance. They're really fun and spicy, <laughs> you guys. Um, <laughs> but I can use a pen name. Needs... <laughs> <laughs> On that note, Bless Jessica you. needs to go <laughs> pick up her four-year-old. So I hope you think about those mafia romances in Thanks the car. For... <laughs> Thanks for joining us. I'm at author Jess Payne on Twitter, where we have our Wednesday night chats. <laughs> Sarah. I'm at, I'm at Sarah Reed author on Twitter. Please join us next time for more giggling and blushing. Yeah. Send us some questions. I wasn't expecting to end this like this. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>